Good afternoon. Hi. I'm Pat. Bernadette. And we're doing a two-part tasting. The first part of the tasting is going to be a blind tasting of five Rieslings from around the world. And then we're going to go over those wines and talk about Riesling and talk about place, where the French call terroir. And then the second part of the tasting, this will be a two different episodes, what I've done is that I cooked up some uh, schnitzel, a dish that would classically be served in Germany with Riesling. In this case, it was chicken schnitzel. And we'll try that with the Rieslings, the Rieslings from different parts of the world. And we'll have some different food accents from uh, different parts of the world. So it'll be a uh, European, American, Asian fusion uh, wine and food pairing. And hopefully we'll have some fun with that. It'll be good. And, uh, and I'm going to be trying to teach Bernadette about one of my favorite grape varieties, uh, Riesling. Riesling comes initially from Germany, uh, uh, specifically the uh, Rhine River Valley, where there tend to be uh, grapes grown on very steep slopes adjacent to the, to the rivers. We have five Rieslings. Uh, the Rieslings come from uh, the Mosul, Germany, the initial origin of, of Riesling. Uh, Alsace, which is in France, but has bounced between France and Germany over the centuries, though the Alsatians consider themselves to be Alsatians. Mm -hmm. And aren't you part Alsatian as yes. well? Mm -hmm. uh, though, though it's an interesting term, uh, uh, because in, in the UK, they refer to German shepherds as Alsatians. So if you were to say that I'm part Alsatian, they would be laughing, thinking that you're part, you know, saying I'm part German shepherd. <laughs> which, is, which is a strange thing, huh? Language is, is a... Uh, nuance. Nuance. Uh, we also have a wine from the Wachau region of Austria. Um, so Austria is going to be uh, warmer than, than Germany. Alsace is warmer than, than Germany. And then uh, we have two warmer places still. We have one wine coming from the Columbia River Valley in Washington State. And the fifth wine is coming from Australia, from the uh, Eden Valley in Australia. Any questions you want to ask me, Bernadette? Because I'm hogging up all what the are, air. What are they? Tell me. What are they? So for the shooting started, I blind tasted the wine. So let's do the first wine first and taste it. And then, and you too. And then we can talk about some of the characteristics. This was the palest of the, of the wines. And the aromatics are elegant, but don't jump out of the glass at you. It's floral. There's some citrus. And there's a little sulfur dioxide, okay, which is a, the smell of a, of a match. And the sulfur dioxide is used to stabilize the wines and prevent them from re, um, re-fermenting in the bottle. That's nice, though. Yeah, I'm not spitting this one out. Okay. I like it. You like it. So it has some sugar. You get sweetness up front. Mm -hmm. There's some lemon, a hint of lime maybe a hint of what the Brits call uh, petrol, or the Germans call petrol, gasoline. It's light to medium bodied. It has fairly low, has the least amount of alcohol of all the wines. And so this combination of light body, elegant floral wine, it's got very crisp acidity, um, tells me that this is coming from a cool climate. Um, and what happens in the Mosul, again, it's, it's very cool. So the grapes have a hard time ripening and certainly had a hard time ripening prior to global warming. So the wines tend to have searingly high acidity levels. And so in order to tame some of that acidity down, the producers tend to leave some sugar in the wine. And this is uh, a Mosul Riesling. Uh, in Germany, because they had a hard time getting ripeness, everything in terms of quality was based upon ripeness level. And so the better group of wines are wines with what's called predicate, 
least ripe and least expensive of those wines are in a group called Cabernet. So this is a Cabernet wine from, um, from the Mosul and is delicious, elegant, mm -hmm. long. Are you sure? I'm sure. It is. It is. So, 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 so when I teach blind, blind tasting to Master of Wine students, one of the things that we look for is what we call a banker, right? And a banker isn't somebody who lends you money, isn't somebody who does uh, uh, complicated swaps to, but instead a banker is something you take to the bank, something that you're sure of. Uh, in American English, it would be a gimme, okay, a, a, mm -hmm. a sure thing. So that was, that was my banker. A softball. A softball. So that, that was a softball. If I, if I may interrupt, um, we purchased these wines at um, the wine exchange here in Santa Ana, California. Um, but uh, if you cannot find these specific wines... So if somebody wanted to have a similar experience, um, would be looking for a recent vintage cabinet from mm -hmm. the Mosul. This one cost thirty two ninety eight. So we generally try to keep the wines at a certain price range, and it's not as if we had a huge selection of, of Rieslings. Mm -hmm. uh, but that all said, uh, the wine's very nice. I think, the, but all in all, delicious mm -hmm. wine. Huh? Yeah, very good. There are uh, touring ships that go up and down the Rhine, up and down the, the Mosul. We need to go there. We haven't been there yet. And it's a very beautiful place. So you can be on this mm. river, and you see these slopes, I mean, literally like this, uh, with uh, vines on them. So it's just, just a, a gorgeous place and a very unusual place, uh, which is why we have a very specific and easy to identify uh, wine style. What a lot of folks don't realize is that before Chardonnay was the uh, premium grape variety in the United States, Riesling was the premium grape variety. Hmm. How far back was that? That was in the uh, in the fifties. Yeah, I don't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit before your time, forties, uh, fifties into the into the sixties, and then there became a progressive uh, transition from uh, Riesling to uh, uh, to Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. uh, we looked; we couldn't find. There are still are some wonderful Rieslings from from California. We couldn't find any. There are some beautiful Rieslings. From New York State, from the from the Finger Lakes, uh, those. Uh, and we'll be going to the Finger Lakes in July. Yeah, and we'll do a shooting yeah. and a uh, and a session there. What I like about Riesling is, um, from Pat, I've learned that um, when you're at a restaurant and you have a certain budget and you're looking for something that could be good on maybe the um, sold by the glass. A lot of times I won't like the oak Chardonnay that they usually sell, but they'll have a Riesling, and if you don't know about Riesling, you wouldn't think of going there. But um, a lot of times the Riesling is a much better quality than the uh, other offerings at a better price. And, Char and Riesling can be a wonderful uh, wine food. What's, what's interesting is that sommeliers generally tend to love it. It's a geeky wine in a sense, but... Um, uh, I think one of the difficulties has been is that uh, the Germans uh, are very specific about naming things. And sometimes these names in German are extremely long and extremely difficult to understand. And so, f so for many consumers, they see this label and these names and they're thinking, what? What's, what's going on here? Um, and I think right. that's led to led to some of mm -hmm. the some of the confusion. Uh, and then you can have a mm -hmm. producer can have their label will be the same, the bottle will be the same, and then just very slight differences on the label, and mm -hmm. there can be very different right. types of wine in the bottle, from dry to mm -hmm. sweet. Yeah. So if you see um, Riesling from the Mosul on the menu, chances are it's really good. Yeah, odds are it's going to be a very nice wine. Elegant wine, not a powerhouse wine, but something that is very easy to drink. And very mm -hmm. nice, here we are on a beautiful Sunday afternoon. So the second wine, should we taste the second wine? Sure. This is a bit more color and had a little dissolved um, 
uh, so there's some bubbles in the bottom of the glass. And the bubbles are from uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, and a trick that winemakers will use, or, or a step, it's an optional step, is leaving some carbon dioxide in the wine uh, to make it taste fresher. And that's usually done, and that's usually done in an effort to boost the acidity, okay? And so what happens, and I'll put, do I have permission to be geeky, ma'am? No, oh, I love geeky. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I love you. <laughs> so, so the geeky part is that uh, the dissolved carbon dioxide uh, goes into what's called equilibrium uh, with combining with water to form carbonic acid. And so the carbonic acid is going to give a boost to the acidity and make the wine taste fresher. And people do that in places where um, uh, there's more ripeness and less acidity and less freshness in the wine. So we take a smell of this wine. It's got some nice floral notes, some riper citrus notes from the first wine, but it sort of smells a bit candied and sweet and sour, okay? And I get just a hint of vinegar on this wine. Mm. And I get a slight bite in the back of my throat from the slight vinegar. So this is, mm. you get that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's, uh, there's no, mm. maybe a hint, a slight residual sugar on here, but it's got a very drying, somewhat bitter finish. So what they've done is that they've used skin, the skins of the wine, usually uh, in the classic white wine making, you don't use skins, but there's a skin contact that gives extra flavor but also gives you some bitterness. Mm -hmm. And you got the bitterness, right? I did. So there's some positive attributes on this wine. And the positive attributes is that you know, it's got some fairly ripe citrus fruit and some floral notes on the nose and up front. But for me, any vinegar taste tends to, dis to detract quite a bit from the wine. And the bitterness from the skin contact makes it fairly short. There's not a, the flavor doesn't last mm -hmm. a whole lot. And so uh, I know that we had one wine that stood out in terms of being the cheapest wine. The cheapest wine isn't always the worst wine. But in this case, I think this is the least expensive wine, which came from the Columbia River Valley in Washington State. The Yakima Valley, yeah, which is, which mm -hmm. is off the Columbia River Valley. And it was $9.99. $9.99. So, so much less expensive. There's not enough vinegar quality there, mm -hmm. and I use the term quality in quotations. In, in wine geek terms, that's volatile acidity. Mm -hmm. Yakima and Columbia River Valleys are far to the east of Seattle. Right? So people who have not been there tend to think that, hey, this is really far north. Seattle's rainy and fairly cold. Mm -hmm. and that all of Washington State's going to be rainy and cold. And that's not the case. And so what happens is that the weather here on the West Coast comes from the Pacific Ocean and moves east the vast majority of the time. And so when there's uh, rain or precipitation, mm -hmm. uh, the clouds tend to dump the rain on the uh, Cascade Mountains, and then as the mm -hmm. weather moves further east, uh, there's drier and warmer air from gunning, having mm -hmm. gone over the Cascade Mountains. Columbia River valleys uh, tend to be very dry, and all the vines are irrigated. There's more substantial stories, but a uh, place that can produce some beautiful wines. This, unfortunately, is not one of them. Mm -hmm. It's not bad, though. It's not I bad. Mean it, though, though it's you in, want one that you find at a bar on the yeah as a house wine or on, sold by the glass yeah that'd be right. fine fine as a house wine uh, mm -hmm. and again it's 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 competing with wines that cost two to three times as much money all right so I'm two for two this third one uh, was the wine that had the deepest color 
and color the three sling can come from several different places. Rieslings are very rarely oaked. Oak can give you color, but that's not the case here. Color can come with some age. Color can come with some skin contact, though not always. Mm -hmm. Color can also come with what's called botrytis. Do you know what botrytis is, Bernadette? It's bad. Well, <laughs> well it looks it, bad. It, don't they get some, something that shouldn't be in it? Bacteria or... So what botrytis is, it's a, um, it's a fungus, okay? It makes the grapes shrivel up and look really fugly, right? Really fugly. And, um, like raisins? Like, yeah, but like moldy raisins. <laughs> and then you say to yourself, why would anybody do anything with those grapes, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out that the, that process makes the juice from those grapes taste like honey and be a bit brighter acidity, and some of the great sweet wines of the world are made with botrytis. Hmm. Um, again, you wonder why, what, what motivated uh, people to try to make uh, grapes with those, make Probably because they grapes. had them, that's what they grew, moldy, shriveled up grapes. They had to do something with it. Well now, in certain parts of the world, people look for those, uh, uh, for those grapes and they can produce some of the great uh, wines of the world. But let's get back to this one. This may or may not have a little uh, botrytis on it. Uh, I think it's got uh, age on it. The nose didn't give me a whole lot. You know, it, uh, I got a little bit of citrus, a slight bit of herbaceousness. I got maybe a hint of mushroom that you can sometimes get with a hint of botrytis. And I got a little bit of, of petrol. Uh, so I thought this may have a little bit of age on it, and uh, on the palate, you know, fairly nice, uh, dry, powerful, a bit on the uh, on the austere side. Mm -hmm. um, it it wasn't my favorite, but it was you know, reasonably nice wine, and I was torn between on this wine and wine number five, saying to myself, is it from Alsace? Or is it from Austria? The climates mm -hmm. are not all that dissimilar, uh, certainly uh, ripeness levels uh, in, in certain vintages. So that's where I was. I was between Alsace and, and Austria. Mm -hmm. yeah. What is your guess? Well, uh, and tough. Uh, so I finally came down on Austria mm -hmm. on this one. And this, it's Austria. And this is from a wine region called the Wachau. Uh, which is, again, a very beautiful uh, uh, wine region, uh, can produce stunning uh, Rieslings, and also uh, a grape called Gruner Weltliner, which mm. is... Uh, very nice. Which, which can be very, very delicious. One of our favorites, right? Mm. Yes. So... This, this was the third wine, and it was twenty seven ninety nine, which... Twenty-seven yeah, ninety-nine. Yeah, I wouldn't pay twenty-seven ninety-nine for that. It was a lot. Yeah. For, yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. The next mm -hmm. wine was the lightest in color. Though to be perfectly honest, the colors didn't vary all that much. It was the palest of the wines, and this one also had, when I first looked at it, had some bubbles on the bottom of the glass, so it's some carbon dioxide. So when I see that again, uh, I'm thinking, uh, mm -hmm. could the wine be refermenting? And it wasn't. Uh, or did the winemaker, is this wine coming from a warmer region and they've left a little dissolved carbon dioxide to try to boost the freshness of the wine? And on this wine, I'm getting some floral notes, more expressive mm -hmm. on the nose, and I get some lime. Right? And that mm -hmm. lime characteristic uh, used to be one of the classic descriptors for uh, Riesling from Australia. With global climate change and some increased ripeness in other parts of the globe, you can now find some of that uh, lime characteristic elsewhere as well. This wine's also had some skin contact. There's some uh, tannins on it. It's dry, but the skin contact has been very well managed, has mm. nice length, it's nicely balanced. Now, um, 
How much more difficult has global warming made blind tasting? Okay, so uh, we were talking about the effect of global warming and blind tasting. And so there are uh, the extremes that had existed, let's say, 20 years ago uh, in climate from cool to warm are less extreme in a sense. Everything's been shifted to warmer and riper. And so uh, that ha in, has made blind tasting a bit more difficult. The other thing that's made global tasting more difficult is the mov movement of human beings. People in a certain region by tradition made wines just like their fathers did. And things tended not to change much over time. Uh, with uh, inexpensive airfare and now social media, there's exchange of ideas and human beings from all over the globe. So people who train to make wine in Australia or France or California or Germany mm -hmm. now tend to, tend to move around yeah. and they spend a year in this place, a year in that place, mm. and bring back those international ideas to their traditional regions and then incorporate some of those ideas. And so there's been a movement towards cleaner, more interesting wines. Never have there been more good quality wines produced. And that's a good thing. Those are not if you're studying uh, to be a master of wine, though. No, it makes it, makes it, it much harder. It makes it, it makes it a bit, a bit harder. Yeah. That's the wine from Australia. The Australians are technically among the best winemakers in the world. Uh, they've had problems in terms of having mm. fires, uh, more ripeness, so dealing with, with increased levels of, of ripeness. With Riesling, you could just pick it a bit earlier. You could add a little little carbon dioxide to it. Nice wine, a very different style of wine. Uh, the length on the wine is limited a little bit by that skin contact, mm -hmm. but on all, liked it. How would you? Gonna, I did. It was, it was good. Twenty four eighty eight. Okay. And what's and what's interesting is that mm -hmm. most of these uh, Rieslings, as they get older, develop particularly the ones from uh, Europe, but also the ones from New York State tend to develop this petrol characteristic. Uh, the wines of uh, Eden Valley, interestingly, tend to become toasty as, mm -hmm. they, uh, as, as they get older. So now we have uh, one wine left, and since we know what the other four wines are, and it's getting easier with this, with this last one, and so this wine, medium yellow in color, so it was one of two more deeply colored wines, Floral, nicely floral on the nose, maybe with some citrus and a hint of petrol. And it's, um, mm. it's I think it's delicious. It's got some slight tannin, but it's expressive, it's creamy, it's got a nice mouthfeel, it's, it's mm -hmm. rich, it's got nice acidity, it's got a long, long finish. Uh, so this is the wine from Alsace. Maybe it's it it's genetic that I'm wired to <laughs> that my like twenty this. percent of my genome that comes from Alsace uh, in Alsace again. Uh, so Alsace is right um, to the west of the Rhine River. Right, the Rhine River mm -hmm. separates uh, France from Germany. To the west of Alsace are the Vosges Mountains, and so just as in Washington State, the weather coming from usually coming from west to east, the colder, rainier weather mm -hmm. gets hung up in the mountains uh, in Washington State, uh, the Cascade Mountains. In Alsace, the weather comes across and dumps rain and snow in the Vosges Mountains, and then the Alsace is what's called in the rain shadow of mm -hmm. the Vosges Mountains, and that tends to produce these wines that are riper and richer than the wines in the Mosul, which mm -hmm. is really geographically not that far away. The Mosul's just uh, a bit further to the east. So do you have north. a favorite? Do I have a favorite? You know, I, I'm a sucker for classic wines, and so I thought the cabinet from um, the, the German wine, the wine number one, was my favorite wine. I thought that was that Mine was too, but it was the most expensive. The last one. And the last one was that? my second favorite one. Mine too. And that one was twenty nine ninety eight. So 
So we've got so we've tasted through uh, five five wines from different parts of the globe, and what our next part of this tasting is going to be, uh, this will be a two part tasting, is that we're going to have these wines with some uh, traditional uh, German food. Uh, people frequently suggest Riesling to be uh, as a wine with quote unquote Asian cuisine, as we know Asian cuisine is really broad and widely encompassing. So we're going to have some uh, Thai and Korean nuances with the um, the German cuisine, and let's see how it tastes and how the wines go with the food. Cheers! Until next time, give us a love, subscribe, and share it with a friend. Thank you.